What is up, Dynasty Leaguers? Welcome into another episode of Drafting Lessons, the DLF TV show, where I grab a guest every single week and we run through a Dynasty startup or Dynasty rookie mock draft. And since we're just now coming up on the final few days before the NFL draft, we're going to be doing another set of four round rookie mock drafts. And I thought I'd bring on another fantastic guest, Travis May from Rotoviz, from Dynasty Command Center. Uh, he does a whole bunch of stuff over on those outlets. So welcome in, Travis. How's it going, man? Going great. Uh, just glad to be here talking some rookies. It's uh, hard to believe the NFL draft is so close. It doesn't really feel like it yeah. just because uh, nothing else in life is normal. So <laughs> it's not that not that the draft's going to be normal this year. Uh, it's going to be different for some technologically challenged GMs for sure, but uh, always <laughs> fun about talking rookies. So thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, um, you know, the, the the usual thing, one quarterback, uh, we'll assume PPR, but uh, we're going to be doing two four-round mocks. The first one's going to be out of the 104 spot, and the second one will be out of the 111 spot. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of go through all these picks, and yeah, we'll just, we're just just going to get right into it. How about it? All right, let's, let's go. Let's do this thing. All righty, first one out of the four spot. I'll load it up here, and we'll we'll be on the clock. Cool. All righty, Travis, we are on the clock. 104. The first three picks were DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, and Jerry Judy. So we have the pick of the litter. Uh, after, outside of those three picks, C.D. Lamb, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, Edwards Hilaire, uh, Henry Ruggs. Uh, what, what are we looking at here at the 104? Yeah, so at 104, obviously, when you see players like DeAndre Swift and Jonathan Taylor, Jerry Judy, pretty chalky. I think most people have Jonathan Taylor as their, their top overall running back. Uh, maybe Swift gets the draft capital not ahead of him, and so he gets that 1.01 slot. Jerry Judy first wide receiver off the board in the NFL draft probably gets a decent landing spot. Maybe, maybe it looks like he's going to be the wide receiver one for the Raiders. And then, uh, so, so you, I don't know. A lot of people uh, have these three names up in their top five, almost unlocked, but the other name that just seems like a lock to be in the top five, everybody's top five right now, uh, is most likely CD lamb. So a lot of times I want value that I can immediately plug and play and, and contribute to my teams. But I also want, plug and play value in terms of what I can move the player for and what I can use them uh, in terms of just their actual value within the league. Um, so obviously rookie wide receivers don't always produce. They have in the past couple of years uh, in, in some certain cases, but uh, especially last year was kind of like the opposite of what we normally see with uh, productive wide receivers, not always panning out. And the, the ones that didn't pan out actually did produce in the NFL last year as rookies. But I would go with CD lamb here just because I think uh, when you look at his overall production profile, he's got one of the most balanced across this entire class. Uh, so, we're, you know, we, when you just dig into it, obviously he didn't hit the 30% uh, threshold that we typically like to see in terms of breakout uh, until later on in his uh, career, but he did meet minimum thresholds in terms of his, that, 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 that is his uh, dominator rating. I mean, uh, but in terms of his yards per team, pass attempt numbers and any other uh, adjusted production metrics you want to dig into, he and maybe Justin Jefferson have like the, the best, most balanced profiles that also project to get a, a, just elite level uh, draft capital. So I think when you mix the implied draft capital with his, um, you know, just, all the metrics and just uh, what I like in terms of his film grade as well. There's almost nothing to dislike with a player like CD lamb. And so getting him in the, in the four slot um, is, is solid. I would consider a couple other running backs right here, like cam makers, JK Dobbins, especially if they went in top 50, but uh, I'd, I'd probably have to end up going with lamb. So my, my question to you then, uh, if Jerry Judy and CD lamb were both available to you at the one Oh four, would you have still selected CD lamb or is Jerry Judy your top wide receiver in this class? No, actually I would have gone with CD lamb there. I, I do like okay. both. I, I do have CD lamb over Jerry Judy just slightly, but uh, they're, they're very, very close up there in the top tier. Okay. Yeah. Just, just wanted to be sure. Cause lamb is also my wide receiver one in this class as well too. Um, so I was just just curious on that whole dynamic there, but I really like the pick. I think Lamb is the safest player um, 
in terms of wide receivers, especially after like Taylor uh, and Swift as well too. So I think he's going to have, uh, you know, hold significant value through the next, you know, few years. And if he pops off his, uh, his rookie year, kind of like AJ Brown or, you know, Calvin Ridley, even if I'm thinking <laughs> about those types of players, you know, that he's going to be a very valuable dynasty asset. So uh, I, I like it a lot. I like the pick 104 CD lamb a lot. So we're here now 204. Um, the, the rest of the first round was, was pretty stereotypical outside of Joe Burrow. He's always up and down in these drafts. I don't know um, if that's like the computer or the rankings or, or what, but he's always either an early second or like a, a late first, it seems like. Um, but then, whoa, stop it. I'm going to roll back over. But then second round here, T Higgins and AJ Dillon and LaVisca Chenault were the with top three picks in the second round. So two of four here, we're looking at two as the top available quarterback, Michael Pittman, Brandon Ayuk, Brian Edwards, KJ Hamler, Zach Moss, Keyshawn Vaughn, and Eno Benjamin are the top available skill position players. So 2.04 here, who are we looking to pair with CD Lamb? This is my least favorite spot to be in. Like, not even like super early second, not even like 2.01, 2.02, just outside of that range. Almost every single year, I feel like there's somebody that slips out of the first round and it's like, oh man, I, I really wish I had a 2.01, 2.02, that kind of range. And so this is where uh, people start to, you know, quote unquote, reach because there's a lot of difference uh, when it comes to people's overall rankings. Uh, but for me, if, in, in the second round, I, I'm okay going with somebody that I know is going to get top-level draft capital for sure, especially at this point. Uh, it looks like Tua Tungabaloa is going to be a lock for top draft capital. There's a bunch of upside wide receivers uh, that kind of have holes in their profile here and there. Like uh, I like Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, he kind of had a way late breakout due, due to some injuries. I like Brandon Ayuk. I think he's going to get some capital. Uh, you know, he was a Juco guy and broke out way late because he was behind Akil Harry for one year even. Um, but uh, Brian Edwards, obviously, he's he's not 100%. I love Brian Edwards. In fact, I mean, he's been a, a Debbie League darling for his entire career because he broke out at age 17. <laughs> and so if he gets some draft capital, he's, he's probably going to be a player that I select here. But right now, not knowing uh, that the NFL is going to be as fond as uh, draft Twitter has been, um, I, I would probably go with uh, Tua Tango by Lua because um, most quarterbacks you can probably trade in one quarterback leagues for like a second round pick. But young stud stud quarterbacks like Tua that don't come along very often uh, have value and in, in some value insulation throughout the entire rookie contract or so. Really, I mean, you, you can see that. In, I mean, in any leagues, but I'm sure if any any calculators, if you look at the young quarterbacks in the past several classes that had capital, they either hit and maintain their value, or they kind of had a slower breakout and they maintain maintain their value. Even like Mitchell Trubisky had an uptick in value before he kind of saw a downturn in his value. So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, the only the only exception, I guess, would be Josh rosen but uh, he was kind of traded in in uh, in unprecedented style so i'm going to go with Tua tango by here uh right now not knowing uh the entire landing spots and everything of the wide receivers and draft capital involved that's interesting so um Tua hasn't been taken by anybody else um uh, up until this point actually really um quarterbacks haven't all haven't really been taken at all. Justin Herbert, I know, was taken previously, and Jalen Hurts as well, too, but those are in the later rounds. So mm -hmm. two at the 204 is kind of an interesting selection here, and I'm not necessarily hating it. I mean, you gave uh, a fantastic reasoning as to why you selected Tua, especially since, again, this is pre-draft. Um, we don't know where these people are going, and I feel like a lot of these second-round wide receivers and running backs are very draft capital dependent. You know, Zach Moss and Keyshawn Vaughn are great, but they could be going in late day three. Michael Pittman could slide. Ayuk could slide. Edwards, you know, we don't have any combine metrics. He had that injury. He could slide. You know, I think the safety factor of Tua, even with his injury still, I mean, he's going to be fine for, you know, his rookie year or if he waits until like week nine to start or whatever. <laughs> he's, he's a fantastic quarterback. Is he actually your quarterback one in this yeah. class? I know there's a lot of people who – divisive there yeah I, I think he still is i've been back and forth between um really burrow and tua just because of the worry with health but if it if, if there was no worry with health there would be no conversation 
uh, for me. And it's it's funny, like if we had this conversation uh, the week of to his injury last fall, there would be no debate, absolute, absolutely zero debate as of like last late October, early November, um, because Burrow hadn't put together the best college football season of all time uh, on the back of one of the best offenses and offensive systems and uh, a set of offensive playmakers that we've seen uh, in recent history. And so I do like Tua and what he brings to the table. Um, I, I do have health concerns for him. That's the only reason he's neck and neck still with, with Burrow in my rankings. But yeah, he is my QB one. Interesting. And wh- where do you, where would you prefer him to go? Um, since you're selecting him here at 204, where would you like to see him go? I would love to see him actually be with the with the Chargers. Uh, I think him mm-hmm. having some reliable uh, options there, a uh, big kind of. Um, red zone tight end with um, plus Keenan Allen having some veteran wide receivers that are proven guys that he can rely on right away uh, and having a, a receiving back like Eckler to just kind of be a safety valve. He didn't really do that a ton um, with the exception of really this past season with Najee Harris. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think having, having a good offensive system there with some good playmakers, not a perfect o- offensive line, uh, a little leaky, which would be a little discouraging for uh, him staying healthy, I guess. But I, I like his chances to immediately produce there. I like it. Yeah, I think that's gonna, that's a favorite spot for a lot of people mocking uh, a quarterback to the Chargers is is having Tua there at the at the six overall spot. So I like it a lot, and I think if he does land there, I think he's going to hold a lot of value on top of being, um, you know, a, a top fantasy producer yeah. in his immediate season it's kind of like deshaun watson i think you know just kind of pops early and boom he's top five already um yeah. so i like it a lot i like it so 3.04 here um jalen hurts went at the 301 which is interesting again because i haven't seen him go that high um and justin herbert went at the 212 here uh and then eno benjamin and Keyshawn vaughn were the other two picks in the top of the third so 3.04 we're looking at tyler johnson donovan peoples jones antonio gibson anthony mcfarland uh, Hunter Bryant and Cole Komet and snuck here in terms of tight ends. Jordan Love, Darrington Evans, Devin Duvernay, Lynn Bowden Jr. Um, what, what are we looking at here for the 3.04 draft? So at this point, this is the easiest selection out of the remaining pool that, that I've seen um, to this point. Uh, without hesitation, I would I would run to the podium, the digital podium, and, and just slam Antonio Gibson's name down on the paper because th- this is the no-brainer pick for me. Uh, he's an absolute stud athlete he, he really played wide receiver slash running back slash just beastly offensive playmaker uh for for memphis uh this past year had a really strange trek to relevance and uh production but when he was given the opportunity finally he absolutely smashed average like i think it was like 11 yards per carry last year like 20 yards mm-hmm. per reception just an unbelievably efficient lights out playmaker that has Legit straight line speed. I think it was a four three nine or four four at the combine. Uh, really looks more like a running back in that he's you know six feet two hundred and thirty ish pounds. Doesn't really look like a wide receiver. So he, I think most and, and really the buzz has been uh, from most uh, real NFL playmakers that he looks more like and they consider him a running back more so than a wide receiver. So he's easily my running back six. Uh, right now, and really, if he gets some capital, he's probably going to be the running back five and, and usurp one of the, the bigger names uh, in this class, probably for me. So I think right now that that's the easiest decision. He's got all the athleticism you, you want uh, and, and a diverse skill set. If he's in the right spot, it's just going to be absolute money. It's tough for me when I when I look at Antonio Gibson, you know, I, I see how productive he was on limited touches last year in memphis he had like 1100 yards on like 70 touches or something ridiculous like that (laughs) Um, and like 12 touchdowns it's insane um and and so i think that you know he's an explosive guy but my concern is the team that selects him is going to have to utilize him i think in a very specific way um not so much that he's going to be you know, the guy who's getting 200 carries and 70 receptions every single year, even though I do think that he can do that, I don't think that's how he's going to be utilized. And so I feel like we're going to have this kind of struggle if he's drafted. And and it's, I'm, I don't want to use this as like a comp, but like Kenyon Drake, when he was in Miami, right. He just never, ever got 
touches. He never got carries. He never got the usage. And I fear that Antonio Gibson is going to be utilized in kind of the same way where he's really splashed in, in a few weeks when he gets some workload, he pops off a huge play and we're all sitting here as fantasy people. And we're like, man, just give him the ball more, you know, yeah. just, just give the guy the ball. And I'm worried that that is what's going to happen for Antonio Gibson because he is all the talent in the world. Um, but you know, if his usage is held back, that's I think that's going to be the deciding factor on whether he whether or not he's really going to be a breakout running back. Are you at all concerned with in terms of how he's utilized in the NFL? I think a little bit because because I think uh, well, first and foremost, most teams just don't give the player we want enough touches. I mean, like that's just <laughs> that's just where we are in terms of backfields. It's just frustrating week to week for for many playmakers outside like what the top. 15 16 running backs that are kind of locked into their roles it's it becomes really frustrating really quick and and the players that end in the year as a back end running back too you're like how in the world did that happen i hated him all year and and i think that's what antonio gibson could be immediately but if there is a situation where you know there's an injury or, or he you know he is a, he's a 1b in that 1a in that running back by committee situation that's frustrating but he gets that opportunity during that injury period and just takes the reins and never gives it back. I think he has that, that type of talent that he can, he can do that. Uh, and in the third round pick 28, uh, you know, this is, this, this pick really is, is with a late round three capital type situation, or maybe the first couple picks in round four, that, that kind of implied capital. That's probably what, where I'm kind of landing with this, this uh, decision for him. Uh, but if he, isn't you know like an end of day three back i think he's going to be somebody just a lot of people are going to be targeting just based on the athletic upside uh efficiency and just what he could be to a lot of offenses if given the opportunity so i mean because there's really at this point in any rookie draft and virtually any format there's no such thing as a safe pick at this stage and so i'm going to go mm -hmm. for somebody who might have a a couple of sell high windows given those few weeks you mentioned uh even if i'm not sure he's going to hit long term yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've seen his range go from anywhere from like early second round. I know um, j just recently for the DLF YouTube, we posted uh, a first round mock draft from our DLF team, um, a first and second and a third round mock draft. And, and Antonio Gibson went at the 2.02 in that one. So yeah, hey, uh, there's <laughs> people like him. The people that like him really like him. And, and I, I'm right. one of those people, but I I'm, he's not a 2.02 guy yet, but you know, he say he lands with the Chiefs or something crazy. You know, it's like if people would go bananas. So he he could, based on his landing spot, he's probably gonna he's gonna either like end up at the as a back end fourth or an early second or late first. Like somebody's gonna just reach like crazy if he has a decent spot. Yeah, absolutely. So four point oh four here, the last pick in this four round rookie mock. Uh, the the first three picks in this round were Devin Duvernay. Tyler Johnson, uh, man, that's a slip in ADP, and Chase Claypool yeah. here. Um, so we're looking at Cole Komet, Michael Pirine, Adam Troutman, Quintez Cephas, uh, Jake Fromm is there, quarterback Van Jefferson, Colin Johnson, Harrison Bryant. Um, I keep scrolling down here if, if I didn't mention your guy yet. <laughs> man, there's a lot of names here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can you scroll over? I want to see the rest of the, 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 the board if we can and see. Yeah, absolutely. Who else kind of went here just to see where a so, uh, couple other Bowden, Hunter Bryant, Darrington Evans, Jordan Love, DPJ, DJ Dallas, Anthony McFarland, and then Albert O. At nice. The 312. Okay. Well, yeah, that's that's a lot of the, the popular names. It, it, it's, it's like people just kind of get kind of uh, chalky uh, with the selections uh, <laughs> there at that point. Um, let's see. Is, uh, is, has I, Isaiah Hodgins been taken? No, he's right there. Okay. Well, then, yeah. So Isaiah Hodgins actually would be uh, my pick here. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people aren't super high on on Isaiah Hodgins because uh, he didn't have the the blowout NFL combine performance. Uh, he ran like a, I think it was a four six four six one something like that, um, and so he didn't wow uh, there. But the NFL combine is is less important. Uh, at wide receiver than it is running back and really frankly several other uh, positions but really when you watch uh, just from a film grading type standpoint uh, what you see is somebody who moves incredibly fluid 
uh, for a guy that's a legit 6'4", uh, has elite level route running ability and mobility for somebody that size and creates separation not only just with his his wheels but his his his, his ability to kind of set up defenders uh, especially on double moves he's just incredible in that regard but then when you look at what he's done dating back to his age 15 season he he is nonstop just absolutely dominated and performed anywhere he's gone with the exception of I believe his true freshman season uh, for Oregon State, he's absolutely dominated. Been one of the most productive wide receivers uh, in the entire country since he was a sophomore in high school. I think he had like 76 catches as a sophomore, just completely blew it up for two more years. The only reason he didn't have a, a blue chip like recruiting grade back in the day was because, again, his athleticism. He had he had less than optimal. Uh, kind of athletic scores, even in the high school combines. And so that really hurt him. So he ended up going to Oregon State. But really, when given the opportunity, he absolutely annihilated. He had like a 40% adjusted dominator at his peak. He had like 2.8 adjusted yards per team pass attempt, which is like 70th-ish percentile, 75th percentile. Mm -hmm. And so like when you look at him from several different angles, from a, a film standpoint, from a uh, just a production standpoint, from several different angles, you can see an, an, a wide receiver that has succeeded regardless of what people thought of his athleticism for years now. Uh, so if he does land in, in some decent opportunity, he's going to be a great fourth round flyer for people to, to take a long uh, look at rather than trying to get, you know, a, a fourth round tight end or a fifth round, sixth round running back to hit. So, Cause that's what really what you're looking at. I mean, in the fourth round, you're looking at a bunch of day three guys. You're hoping, have a few big weeks or just find a roster spot that you can maybe move. You're not, you know, you're not expecting this guy to be a constant contributor. And so I think Hodgins could be a scoring monster, having to have a big blow up week or, you know, worst case scenario, you're talking about, you know, somebody like a, like a Marquez, a Marquez Valdez Scantling, that, that kind of player. Mm -hmm. uh, but somebody who's, who's thicker, who's, who's more gifted athletically and has a better production profile. So mm -hmm. I like him quite a bit. Yeah, we've seen a lot of wide receivers who, you know, they might not win with speed, but they're winning with the routes. And if that's what Isaiah Hodgins is bringing to the NFL is that elite route running ability. You know, you think of guys like Adam Thielen or Michael Thomas, who they're just, you know, they're beating you with technique. They're not beating you with speed. And if he finds a team that, you know, allows him to do that and just play on the outside and just out route run, you know, cornerbacks, I think he could have, you know, solid production in terms of, of you know fantasy production and like you said fourth round you know you're looking for um you know just some sort of a dart to hit i think mm -hmm. you could do a, a lot worse than isaiah hodgins uh you know in in that fourth round there so i like him a lot he's a name that i have been modern monitoring um for for a little while there so i'm actually glad that you highlighted him and picked him out there <laughs> sure Sweet. So that was the first four round rookie mock draft out of the 1.04. We're going to just get right into the second one here um, out of the 111 spot. So let's see where we're what we're looking at here. Uh, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, Jerry Judy, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Ayers, Edward Tolaire, Rager, Ruggs, and Jefferson. So at the 111, um, we're looking at T. Higgins, Denzel Mims, uh, any of the quarterbacks, LaVisca, Michael Pittman, Brandon Ayuk, um, all those second round wide receivers that we talked about uh, in the second round of the last draft. So 111 here, what are we looking at, Travis? So that's like worst case scenario, right? I mean, it's like your top five wide receivers and your top five running backs off the board, like the, like the consensus, super, super just chalky. Like these guys have been in the first round discussion all of them like since the since late last fall uh, in terms of uh rookie drafts and so these guys are the locks and so they're all gone so what do you do i, I mean in in most cases uh, in most cases i'd be open uh at this range to kind of shopping if somebody wants to move move up to this slot i'd, I'd consider moving down and adding another future pick as well or at just taking this and turning it into an actual contributing playmaker that i don't have to guess on uh, that I, I fill in uh, as another, you know, back end wide receiver two, wide receiver three option that will contribute on a strong contending team. Because I think a lot of people will do that, especially if they have a their guy type player uh, in this range. Uh, especially, I mean, if even if you're looking at just moving for another random 2021 20, first plus a third or something like that, I mean, you, you can consider all 
all things uh, when you when you miss on uh, kind of a tear break here in terms of consensus. But I would actually go with Denzel Mims uh, in this slot at the one point eleven. Uh, that's what I would uh, do, and, and not really. I mean, if if nobody gives me a good value, that would be my no brainer, uh, definite safe pick at this range. Uh, another player that really has been a, a Debbie darling for quite some time. The only reason that he uh, kind of ever saw any downturn was because he kind of had a uh, a down year. I think it was either, I guess it was his junior year. He went from, you know, like a thousand yards, eight touchdowns or something like that. in in Baylor's like one in 11 season to uh, mm -hmm. a downturn to like 700 yards or something. So the raw production wasn't as impressive. And so he didn't even go out as an early entry wide receiver. A lot of people kind of like, eh, you know, is he really going to ba Baylor wide receivers? They haven't really hit lately. So they're just hard fade on Denzel Mims and then enter Denzel Mims to the senior bowl and the hype begins. And then he, you know, he kills it at the combine, combine, combine running like a <laughs> four, three, eight, having like a 40 inch bird just across the board. Like, I think there was only one drill he didn't absolutely kill. It was either the cone or the shuttle. He didn't absolutely just kill it. And, and so answering any questions we had about his physical profile um, and he, he wins with speed, he wins with route running and he wins with physicality. He wins any way an offense wants him to. And because of that, I believe uh, that if you, I mean, even just looking at the betting props, you can kind of know, okay, Denzel Mims is probably a top 50 draft capital type wide receiver right now. Uh, and then people took a closer look at his over overall adjusted production profile. And they see a player that broke out in, in his true sophomore season uh, in a big way, and then really peaked at like a 42% something dominator like that. And had, again, about an average in terms of drafted NFL wide receivers, about an average uh, yards per team pass attempt numbers. And, and it, for listeners that aren't familiar with that metric, because I know dominator is, is more uh, prevalent and, and more, I guess, readily understood, widely understood. Yards per team pass attempt is exactly uh, what it sounds like. Uh, it, but uh, if it basically, if you adjust them, uh, you're basically adjusting for his per game numbers to compared to the, to the uh, overall teams per game numbers, but anything around like 2.5 and above is uh, basically above average for drafted NFL wide receivers in terms of yards per team pass attempt. And he was right around that 2.5 yards per team pass attempts in terms of his per game numbers and so uh and what, what we found and just digging into metrics that mean more at the nfl level is that yards per team pass attempt is actually even stickier than than dominator has uh has been proven to be in, in predicting future nfl production so i i frame that just because i know a lot of people i mean i'm sure you're familiar with that addison but i, I know that that's newer at least newer in terms of be it being accepted as a, a meaningful metric uh, yeah, but right. uh but yeah, so Mims it checks the box there. He checks the box uh, on his dominator. He checks the box athletically. He checks the box here soon with capital. It just seems like a no-brainer as, as a lock for late first value. So I tweeted out, uh, I don't know if this was yesterday or a couple of days ago, um, but I tweeted out uh, a stat about um, four-year or longer wide receivers. So basically wide receivers who don't early declare. Um you know, and, and they go into the NFL after playing a full four seasons or more in the in, in college. And uh, I've since reframed it a little bit because I was talking with Jordan McNamara about it. Um, and I've taken out undrafted uh, free agent wide receivers. But anyway, so the stat is 213 wide receivers who've attended the NFL combine since 2005 after playing in college for four or more seasons um, uh, of those 213 wide receivers, only 40. Um, had one or more top 36 fantasy season. And um, that is a pretty compelling number. But I also think that there's uh, a lot that goes into that as well, too, in terms of, you know, that's not really adjusting for draft capital, which I also plan to do after the NFL draft. Um, and uh, a, a lot of other stuff that goes into it, you know, not even talking about metrics or analytics or anything. But so just using that, 40 out of 213 had at least one top 36 season. Um, so there's four players in the top 24 of DLF rookie ADP, Brian Edwards, Michael Pittman, Tyler Johnson, and Denzel Mims are the four players that fit that criteria. Um, so I'm not trying to say this to scare anybody because of those four players, I think Mims is the guy that breaks that. I think he's the probability, the 25% guy who breaks that because a, he's going to have the highest draft capital out of these guys, 
I think he's the better player out of all those guys. And, you know, just like you said, everything that everything you literally just said, analytically, his profile, his production, all that stuff um, it is all points toward him being a fantasy producer and a hit, um, you know, at, at this stage here. But my only other question then after all that stuff, uh, if you want to talk about that or whatever, but um, T Higgins is also, I think, an interesting name at this point at the end of the first round here. Um, why do you like Mims um, much more than, than Hayden's, it seems? So uh, just first off, I think Mims is actually going to see better capital than, than T. Higgins. I think T. Higgins mm -hmm. gets a bump because he is a Clemson wide receiver and a lot of people watch him just more naturally. That They've seen five complete games of him probably at least if, if you don't watch college football hardly at all. And so they're, they're familiar with him. That He's made some big plays. He's got elite deep deep ball tracking skills. Um, and so there's a lot to like really just from a raw just film perspective. But analyt analytically speaking, he doesn't check uh, just about any box. Um, I mean, he, he misses most minimum thresholds except for, you know, I guess if you want to include players that, you know, break out with 20% and ad adjusted dominator, that, that's okay. Uh, misses the threshold in yards per team pass attempt any way you slice up his profile. Uh, so for, for production wise, he's, he's uh, less interesting. Um, and then uh, athletically, uh, everyone knew he was going to be less interesting. Uh, and then he, you know, he chose to do, you know, his pro day. And I guess he had an okay pro day time, but it's a pro day time. Um, so I think um, he's just less safe. Uh, I think uh, I, I could see him working out, uh, but I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very not confident uh, in that. So, uh, he he feels like a, a great player. I'm comfortable take taking like early round two as an upside play, but probably not here uh, the late one. Yeah, I I just I just wanted to ask your opinion on T Higgins there because I I, I do know that he has that ADP there for late first round. Um, yep. And also, I yeah I saw him mocked recently in, in Matt Miller's mock. He went in the early second to Houston, which I thought was interesting. And I thought would that would be the thing that would raise his ADP. Oh yeah, um, that I'd absolutely it, yeah, it definitely would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just uh, it was just interesting um, when I, when I saw that, and I was like, man, that would be what T Higgins actually needs is a, a team like Houston to to take him or Philly if they pass on a wide receiver in the first and they grab him in the second or something like that. You know, that type of scenario I think is what Higgins needs to to be more of a fantasy hit. Um, but yeah, I, I'm in agreement. I would I would take Mims over Higgins there. Um, and, uh, you know, analytics for sure. hundred percent. We're in agreement there. <laughs> I got nothing more sure. to say. Um, <laughs> two, <laughs> two 11 here. Um, so the other players who went, um, at the, the top of the second here, AJ Dillon, KJ Hamler, Joe Burrow, Keyshawn Vaughn, Michael Pittman, LaVisca, Zach Moss, Brian Edwards, Tua and Brandon Ayuk. So, uh, we're looking at, Eno Benjamin, Justin Herbert, uh, Tyler Johnson, Donovan Peoples Jones. Antonio Gibson, Anthony McFarland, and Antonio Gandy Golden, um, other quarterbacks and tight ends down here. Uh, but but two eleven here. Who are we pairing with Denzel Mims? So I, I know I, on the the last mock I, we already talked about Antonio Gibson. I would probably just because I, I'm a believer in him, and if he does get day two capital, it would be an easy decision to take him here uh, at this slot. I would do that. But I think in this case, without knowing that he's going at, going to actually be drafted very high. Uh, I'm going to go to, again to a player that I know is going to be drafted probably top 10, top six, seven, what, the latest really uh, in the real NFL draft. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't like to go quarterbacks because it's not super sexy, especially in one quarterback leagues. But I'm going to go with Justin Herbert here. Uh, I think uh, people don't understand that he's actually incredibly mobile. Uh, so he's going to add some uh, as a runner. Uh, people think of, you know, um, I mean, really, in this class, they think Jalen Hurts is the guy to go with mobility. And I, I absolutely like Jalen Hurts as a kind of later round target at quarterback because he could be that uh, skeleton, skeleton key Konami code type uh, rusher passer <laughs> if he does get that opportunity. Uh, I just right. I'm not as sure that, he, that he's going to get the capital. Uh, and Justin Herbert is a lock to go day one, top 10 picks. And if you look at everyone around him in this range, we're looking at a bunch of maybe round three guys, maybe round four guys, uh, maybe the tight end one, tight end two that goes at the end of day two. A bunch of guys that don't don't really have their team investing much in them. Uh, just from so from a sheer just 
draft capital only analysis, it seems like Herbert is, is the safest bet to actually return something for your rookie pick. But not only that, he actually, outside of his, his strange junior year, which was just, he was a different player, it seemed, every single week. Um, outside of that uh, and him struggling with some health early on in his career, he looks like he's really come around in, in terms of his overall uh, passing profile. He's he's really solid. He's he's basically three years in a row been a top 10, 15 adjusted yards per pass attempt uh, passer uh, across the entire uh, the entirety of college football, uh, just pretty consistently. And when you add in the the mobility the, that he actually has, uh, and that's actually what got him hurt uh, from time to time in college but uh you know when you add that in with the mobility and what he can do uh, again i think it'd be fun to be on the chargers i think it'd be fun for him to be on even the dolphins i think he could just be that fun uh gunslinging passer that that can really you know throwing it he can really throw it 60 yards downfield uh he's gonna have some interceptions too he he struggled with some decision making uh, from time to time but um i think as a qb3 in this class getting him at the end of you know round two in rookie drafts uh, is, is phenomenal. I, I don't know what to think about Justin Herbert because to be honest with you, yeah, his junior season was really strange. Um, but you know, coming into his senior season here, I don't think he really did all that much to sway him being dropped or, you know, bumped in, in, at, at all. I just think he just kind of was there and just did his thing. And, and, and that's, you know, what he is and, and that's what he's going to be in the NFL. So I don't know if, he's going to be more of like a Derek Carr, Andy Dalton type wide receiver or quarterback um, in, in the NFL, or if he can bump up to be, you know, kind of like uh, maybe on the high end, like a, a Jared Goff or a Kirk Cousins or something like that. I don't know if that's really the range of outcomes for Justin Herbert there. I'm just really hesitant on him as a prospect overall, um, because I just, I, I just think he's not like mediocre, but I just think he's just kind of there. You know, and, and mm -hmm. that's why, like, I'm not a huge fan of him in this class. But I get it though, because you know, again, this is pre-draft. He's gonna have the capital, obviously. And a lot of people are talking about him being taken over two. Um, you know, it's potentially the Miami Dolphins are taking him at five, or you know, there's that whole thing with the Dolphins trading up to one and the Bengals getting Herbert at five because the Bengals like him a lot too, and they coached him at the Senior Bowl. Um, you know, that whole thing. So it's going to be interesting come draft day where he actually goes. But I just, you know, if he doesn't go to the Chargers, I just don't know if he becomes kind of a, you know, perennial quarterback one. He's just kind of just going to be there in the NFL and you'll be happy taking him as your your quarterback two or like a, a QB three in Superflex. Yeah, I think that's that you're not alone in that take. I think there's a lot of people there because his profile is just, it just from any angle, it's not – you know, absolutely elite. It doesn't, when you put his name up to, you know, really hit just any of his passing stats up to the normal top five overall selection in the most recent classes, he doesn't measure up like even to like Baker Mayfield, uh, Kyler Murray. Uh, he doesn't, his adjusted passing numbers aren't the same or his mobility isn't the same. And so it's like, he does have the mobility. He does have the decent, uh, pretty good adjusted passing profile, but does he really, is he really worth the top five, uh, top 10 overall selection uh, as a quarterback in the real NFL draft. And I, I think that's a valid question. I think if it weren't for positional premiums with uh, quarterbacks just having to be drafted highly, you know, there are several quarterbacks who wouldn't see, uh, you know, go quite as high as they, they have here recently, like Josh Rosen or even Josh Allen, who was a pathetic passer in, in college and still isn't good. Uh, but I think he's somebody that that could be, uh, like a Josh Allen, like he's just never going to make it as a, as an NFL passer, just all around being perfect. But that's not really what we want in fantasy football. We just want a team to believe in him enough to take him highly and invest four years into him. And there's going to be some ebbs and flows in, in, in his value that make him uh, more expensive than the original draft uh, investment, or he can help save you down the stretch, uh, plugging him in for uh, your, your, preferred quarterback in a bye week or even in the championship if you need him. So I think most years you can get these quarterbacks early third round, um, you know, maybe the end of the second round and a lot of lots of drafts where most of my leagues that are one QB will start to take their players 
back into the second that are these quarterbacks that they want to kind of invest in as safer picks. And I think it's just about the safety of, of seeing that return on value here for me, um, mixed in with the, the, the upside of his mobility and, and com- combination with a good enough passing profile. Yeah, for sure. So three eleven here, um, you know, looking at the third round, Tyler Johnson, DPJ, Jalen Hurts, Anthony McFarland, Antonio Gibson, Darrington Evans, AGG, Love, Kelly, and Chase Claypool. So 311, we got three tight ends up here. Hunter Bryant, Cole Komet, Bryson Hopkins, and then we got Albert O and Adam Troutman down there as well, too. Devin Duvernay, Lynn Bowden, LaMichael P. Ryan, um, Jake Fromm, Van Jefferson, Colin Johnson, another Harrison Bryant. Um, so 311 here. I can keep scrolling down unless I, I, I got your pick here. What are we looking at? <laughs> no, you're good. Um, so Albert Okoy Bunham uh, would be my pick here. Uh, most people mm-hmm. just want to call them uh, Albert O or uh, Aquaman. Uh, I, I like Aquaman, actually, calling him Aquaman. Uh, that's easier than saying Okoy Bunham. Uh, but uh, he's a guy that, that really broke out uh, immediately uh, from, from Missouri. Actually, uh, you know, a lot of people want to see like a 20% receiving dominator rating. Uh, as a breakout year for a true freshman or maybe a sophomore, but he actually broke that threshold as a, as a, as a uh, tight end. Uh, and in his first, I guess it was his red shirt freshman season for Missouri back in 2017. And all he does is score touchdowns. Uh, and most, most of his touchdowns were schemed open that first year. Like it was the same, like uh, he would fake like he was blocking then he'd break kind of over the seam or he kind of like give it a little wiggle into a, a, a shorter post. Um, and it was like the same touchdowns, like half his touchdowns or more was the same exact play his first year. Uh, but I saw him really branch out, learn how to kind of run the full route tree beyond that. And and really just from a, an adjusted production standpoint, he, he only got better and better, even though his raw numbers weren't great. His dominator actually increased every single year. Uh, the passing situation was absolutely gross in, in his final season. Uh, I mean, Kelly Bryant was supposed to be an upgrade at quarterback, and that didn't work out. Uh, everyone was <laughs> very, very let down for M- M- Mizzou fans. I actually, I took my grandpa, uh, who had never been to a Mizzou game ever. He's like lifelong Mizzou fan. He's, he's from St. Louis, and uh, I, th- I, I, I have uh, season tickets to Vandy because my, my wife works there. And so we go all the time. I was like, oh, I'm going to take my grandpa. We're going to get to see this blowout of Vandy. It's going to be great. And Vanderbilt, lo and behold, actually beat Missouri because they were so freaking bad this last year. Uh, They just couldn't do anything. In that game, uh, Kelly Bryant just left him out to dry so badly. He put a ball like 10, I think I'm just going to say 100 yards into the air, too high. And uh, Alberto went up, got kicked, like hit in the legs, flipped upside down, landed on his head, got back up, and the next drive had a – same route and and caught a, a pass right over the middle. Uh, he he just does everything you want to see. Scoring touchdowns. He's got the straight line speed. I haven't even mentioned that. He's only tied in in this class with just uh, incredible straight line speed and athleticism. Uh, I mean, obviously running a four four nine. At, you know, just a two hundred fifty eight pounds. It's no big deal. Uh, so I think a player like that, uh, that kind of elite level athlete at a position that uh, is undervalued consistently every single year in rookie drafts, taking him at three eleven, pick like 35. That's an absolute no brainer for uh, a player that I believe is a tight end one in this class. Albert O is my automatic third round pick in every rookie draft. Like, yeah. There's literally, <laughs> there's <laughs> yeah. literally no question about it. I mean, unless like Antonio Gibson's there and he's got like the draft capital. Um, but like Albert O literally screams top five tight end in the NFL. Um, yeah. and, and it's, it's, man, I could not, I, I picked him in the third round of our DLF rookie, rookie mock, the, the video that we did for YouTube. Um, I took him in the third round of another, uh, YouTube rookie mock for, with Roto heat. I took him, you know, in the third round of, of some other DLF mock for like an article. Like it's like everywhere I can, the Albert O is there. He's, you know, he's my pick. He's gone. And his speed score, he had like 128 speed score, um, uh, weight and height adjusted speed score, and yeah, that joined Jimmy Graham, Greg Olson, and Vernon Davis. <laughs> With, Absolutely, like, just, like what? <laughs> oh my gosh, twenty three touchdowns! Like he literally, like, and, and I get like he's not a great blocker. Like I'm sure you saw that on film. Like the dude, like can't really block. And uh, I mean, that's you can look at at that as like both a positive and a negative. And like a positive in the sense that 
when he's on the field, he's going to be on the field, most likely probably in the slot or like just lined up at tight end, but he's going to be running a route and he's going to be there to catch passes and make plays. But it could be, you know, a negative in the sense that he's not out there as much because he can't block. So they might have to do it like a whole <laughs> blocking tight end thing. You know, yeah. like he's not George Kittle. He's not doing both out there. So he's not playing 98% of the snaps. But when he's out there, he's going to be making plays and he's going to be, you know, just catching passes and he's going to find the end zone. I love him. Let's just automatic third round pick, Alberto. Everybody do it. Everybody join on board. Travis is on board. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Let's just all in, all in right here with the Albert Okoye Bunham. And by the way, if you're struggling with how to say his name, he actually has it. Well, I, don't, I haven't checked it in a while, but I think he actually has how to say his name on his uh, Twitter bio. So uh, you can go check that out if, if you're cur- curious. It's Okoye Bunham if, if you uh, need to practice that in, in the mirror a few times. But uh, if you, or if you just want to impress your friends that you're live rookie draft this year, go for it. <laughs> I love it. So 411 here, last pick of this mock and last pick of the video here. Um, th- this is really, we're looking at uh, a dart throw of a player, I'm assuming. Uh, a whole bunch of other fourth round picks went um, that I'm not really going to gonna run through here. Isaiah Hodgins actually went at the 410. Um, which sniped me, man. Is it's not cool. <laughs> So Adam Troutman, Harrison Bryant, uh, Gabriel Davis, DJ Dallas, Michael Warren, Thaddeus Moss, John Hightower, KJ Hill, uh, Jacob Eason is up there at quarterback. Um, a whole bunch of, of other players down here. You can shout out a player that you're really looking at. Um, uh, okay. So yeah, there's spot, but it- yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of fun players to to kind of talk about in this range. Uh, if you want to just be safe and go with a player that's probably going to get some capital. Uh, again, it's probably you can stay boring and and go with Jacob Eason, but in in this case, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm actually going to go with a player that I think um, we're going to see. We're going to be surprised at his draft capital uh, when when it's all said and done. I think at one point, I think the highest I had him rated was uh, I think player 36 in my rookie rankings. Uh, I think he's a little bit lower now, given uh, how his uh, combine went, and he's just kind of been. Flowing, going under the, under the radar, I guess. But James Proch mm-hmm. from SMU uh, was, uh, he's probably, I, I think, I don't know, I can't remember who was hyping him up. But maybe it was Daniel Jeremiah here recently. Said he had like the best hands in this NFL draft. And that really, I, I believe it. And he, he was he was just falling out for SMU uh, this past year. Obviously, uh, Shane Bichel made it a, a lot better uh, in terms of just con- consistency on the offense. But he broke records for SMU this past year, had 111 catches, over 1,200 yards, and 15 scores. Uh, he, I mean, for his career, he had almost 40 touchdowns there. In fact, even back when Cortland Sutton and Trey Quinn were still on his team back in 2017, and offensive coordinator was Chad Morris, and they was just uh, – Chad Morris, if you're not familiar with, with him, he's, he's all into kind of funnel offenses, goes through a couple options uh, almost exclusively, but he was like, nope, I'm going to include Proche – Gave him 40 catches for 800 yards uh, in in Proch's uh, true sophomore season, uh, so really just just missed the kind of dominator rating you want to see uh, that season. But every other year he had at least a 24 percent dominator rating, and, and including a, like a just under 40 percent, I think, in his junior year. Uh, and last season having like a 36% because everybody was just catching touchdowns. It was just bizarre. Everybody just left and right. The whole offense was going off, uh, but. And James Proch uh, does everything well. He's a little bit undersized. I think he probably profiles as a better um, really slot wide receiver. He's also a little bit older in, in terms of uh, being a rookie that's going to hit. I, I'm a, a fan of younger wide receivers. Anal- analytically speaking, younger wide receivers typically hit at a higher rate. But if I'm going to bet on an outlier at the end of round four, uh, the, the, his name is most definitely going to be James Proch. Or actually, sorry, see- Proche, I should say. I always do that. Like I start, so when I first started watching and paying attention to him in 2017, I kept on calling him Proche. And even now I know it's Proche and I, I, I keep on saying it. But anyway, James Proche is his name. So do you see like a lot of like Trey Quinn in the, in that that similar sense? You know, Quinn was the um, Mr. Irrelevant in, in 2017 or 18, 17. When did he get drafted? Yeah. Yeah. 20, anyway. uh, yeah. 2017. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, yeah. 2017. But 
Actually, um, no, 2018, because his last season was 2017. So he got drafted in 2018. The 2018 yes. NFL draft. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, I, I see that a little bit, except that I see a player that can be a lot more um, a lot more efficient uh, than Trey Quinn. I mean, even in that year where they were on the same team, uh, he was he was more of like a, a deep threat even in that offense. Uh, this mm-hmm. past couple of years, past couple of years, he's been more of a, a volume guy uh, where they just kind of force it his way no matter what. Uh, and and uh, Reggie Roberson, another stud to watch from SMU. He's going to be relevant next year. Probably going to even get higher draft capital than James Roche and still, you know, producing with future NFL talent around him. Um, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, I, I really do think he can plug plug and play and have definitely higher capital than somebody like Trey Quinn. Yeah, it's just when when you say broke records at SMU and I, and you remember that Cortland Sutton and Trey Quinn were both, you know, high production wide receivers at on his team SMU. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and <laughs> like, like and, and there's other guys too like like emmanuel sanders smu like a lot of people don't realize that you know that some of the top aac uh teams uh, are just as good or better than a, a bunch of power five teams and smu is one of those teams that could that could hold their own every single year in most power five conferences and and the, their playmakers show it year in year out yeah I like that pick a lot. Um, James Prochet, wide receiver out of SMU, named to monitor in uh, draft day and uh, in your rookie drafts as well, too. So, hey, that wraps up our two four-round rookie mocks out of the 104 and the 111. I liked, um, I, I liked all of your picks, basically, um, uh, for every single round. Uh, uh, your reasoning for it, the analytics behind it. Um, and, and the film process as well too. So Travis, thank you so much for for jumping on and, and doing these with me. Um, I know that we're really excited to get the NFL draft here. Um, so the next drafting lessons is actually going to be after the NFL draft. But um, yeah, thank you so much for for joining me today and uh, talking about some of these rookies here, man. So I'm just going to give you the opportunity to you know plug away, tell the people where they can find you, what kind of work you're working on, uh, all that stuff here. Sure. Well, thanks again for having me, Addison. It's just been a blast just talking about all these rookies and doing this, this kind of exercise is so fun. Just kind of like, okay, I got sniped there. Who am I taking? <laughs> and so it's just good, <laughs> kind of a good uh, exercise for my brain to kind of uh, be on the clock right now. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. um, and, and are already in some drafts right now even. So it, it's been good to have some practice before the show. But uh, I, I am actually doing a lot at Rotoviz. Uh, I've been covering some uh, Debbie and college players a lot there. He recently talked about uh, some uh, success of transfer wide receivers, running backs and quarterbacks and things like that here recently in a couple of different pieces, really trying to just figure out what um, what college production means uh, at every level um, throughout the Debbie process, for, but for even for college football dynasty and college football DFS and things like that, I, I do a, a DFS piece weekly for Rotoviz in, in season for college. And so be looking for that this fall, but right now doing a bunch of working on, on, on a bunch of stuff that we're about to release for NFL draft. And we've got the dynasty command center, uh, rookie guide, uh, again, uh, released and two issues of that have already come out, but the third is going to come out right after the NFL draft. Uh, so be looking for that. There's actually a whole page on Rotoviz just dedicated to the, the rookie guide series. I mean, I think we're up to 60 pages or something. Uh, of a magazine that uh, I mean, it's a, just a great deal that has a tons of different formatted rankings. I mean, it's got some IDP in there. It's got a little bit of every every bit of everything for every kind of league. Uh, so just been been doing that, and then of course the Dynasty uh, Dynasty Command Center podcast, doing that with Curtis uh, most weeks. Uh, you know, having one or two shows some here recently. So been a blast. But and then at closer to the season, I probably will do some more uh, Music City Miracles stuff. Uh, for uh, Titans coverage, but just always uh, talking about football 24 seven. So <laughs> thanks again for having me. All right. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming on again. I say thank you like 5 million times at the end of all these episodes, <laughs> but um, yeah. that's just because I mean it. <laughs> well, I, I so, thank you for thanking me and uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, all righty. So to, uh, to, to all the people watching this on YouTube, thank you for, for watching and tuning in here. Um, as we're doing all these rookie mocks on drafting lessons. So like I said, uh, just just before the next time that we're doing this, it's going to be after the NFL draft, and it's going to be when a lot of you guys are going to be doing your dynasty rookie mocks. So um, it's going to be, I think, even more important to have landing spots for all these guys and to have post-NFL draft 
um, rookie values for a lot of these players. So um, stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give this video a like if you, if you liked your content, if you liked Travis, um, please uh, leave a comment down below as well too if you agree or disagree with any of Travis's picks or you can hit him up on Twitter uh, as well too. Tra What's your Twitter handle real, real quick? Yeah, sure. It's at FF underscore Travis M. And so I'm always down to talk football there and uh, DMs are open, but uh, be nice. <laughs> it, the link will be uh, in the description for, for Travis's uh, Twitter handle as well too. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll catch you guys next week after the NFL draft with another episode of Drafting Lessons. See ya.